please wait until after the talk to, do, to <laughs> decide if you'd like to clap again or not. <laughs> Let's see if I can find my remote control here. So first of all, I just wanted to say thank you, uh, everyone, for being here for this topic. I'm very excited about it, but I wanted to give a special uh, thanks to Stefan Karjlis and Bill and Steve and everybody here at LRC and at Columbia. I've had a chance to meet some of you. Uh, sometimes uh, on a, a few visits uh, in the fall and then in the spring with colleagues from Yale, and I'm really excited about the synergy between our schools, and so that's that's very neat. It's very very special to be here. So thank you. Um, and so here is the yeah the the basic uh, title of the talk. Uh, and as Steve said, what I'm going to really try to do today is to present some of the research that's going on in this emerging field or discourse or uh, area that's called. Linguistic landscape, although both of those words have asterisks next to them, not everyone agrees or calls it the same thing. Um, and then sort of talk about some projects that are going on where uh, this idea is being used in classrooms, many of them language classrooms, many of them in other, the other areas. And then sort of talk about a few of the projects that I've done in, in language classrooms uh, with linguistic landscape. And then to open up uh, the discussion for a response by a couple of colleagues in Spanish here, I believe, who are doing uh, amazing work um, in the city and outside the classroom and bridging these two spaces, and then to think together with everyone here about how your classes uh, connect to communities, how your classes connect to uh, the diversity of languages that are present in our cities. And so, as we go through the presentation, I hope you can just ask yourself, you know, how does this apply and connect to my teaching and the work that I'm doing and um, these, these kinds of connections because it really it's an invitation for a conversation. Um, linguistic, what? Linguistic landscape. Uh, these words haven't been around together uh, that long and if you look them up on Google actually what you'll usually see is a description of the distribution of speakers of a language in a particular country or region or something and that's not exactly what I'm talking about today. Talking about something like this, which uh, is a big news item that came up uh, in Richmond, BC, uh, in Canada, last week, actually. Um, and if you go to that website, and all these websites will be available to you after, you can actually watch a video in the local news about people who are debating whether it's okay for Crest Toothpaste to put its advertisements up uh, in public spaces uh, at bus stops and such only in Chinese because half of the local population is uh, Chinese speaking and reading, and so there's a big debate going on about that. Well, BC, uh, you know, it's kind of far away in Vancouver, right? But Flushing and other neighborhoods in New York are no strangers to debates about whether or not stores, shops, uh, voting materials, and other kinds of public language should be and can be in other languages without English, in a mixture of languages, or how they should appear. So Ethnic Friction Over Science That Lacks Black Translations is this title from 2004 from New York Times. You can search a little bit uh, into the neighborhood histories and you must, you must know much more than I do about the local histories of these kinds of discussions, debates, sometimes even conflicts, um, and, and proposed and passed legislation mandating that English be included together with Spanish, with Chinese, with Arabic, with other languages that you teach and our students are learning so this is a question, a linguistic landscape is not just about signs and how beautiful, pretty they are, or, or how simple they are, but the fact that this is a place where we as a society are engaged in discussion and cooperation in many cases, but also conflict and the question of how are we to be as a multilingual society is taking place here. Of course, as a language learner, and I learned Korean a while ago, it's also a wonderful invitation to new vocabulary. Are there Korean readers in the room? Okay, this is a great time for a lesson, okay? So, right? <laughs> this is such an odd moment, right? <laughs> now, let alone uh, what, what uh, men and women look like in these pictures, and we should remember that too, but uh, woman is Yoja. Would you like to try? Yoja. Yoja. Yeah, Yoja. Do you see the cha is the same on both sides? Namja is man. You want to try? Namja. Namja. Oh, this is perfect. It's great. It's wonderful. And this is the kind of thing that I was so excited to see when I first uh, visited in Mexico and in Spanish, and then uh, later in Japan and, and Korea. And I lived and worked there as a, in a nonprofit organization, and I did some teaching in Japan, and uh, a whole lot of other things. 
But it's not just other languages. Of course, uh, learners of English, when I was tutoring and working with the English language program at UC Berkeley, came up and asked me, why? Why are drugs free on uh, Durant <laughs> Avenue? <laughs> so, oh dear, you know, we need some syntax uh, you know, uh, work here, but of course drugs aren't free, at least in most places. Uh, well, you might you. Um, this was actually a picture taken by a student, and, and they should ask him, why, why, you know, this is so interesting. But they were a very good uh, language, it's a very strong in, uh, incentive to learn language, right? And you see that things are free. Um, but then you start learning science when you start to be able to read a little bit more, you can start to see all these interesting classifications and names and ways that science point to realities of society and institutions and politics that aren't quite the same as the place that you come from. So this sign right up here, 문화시민은 가축통행 means cultured citizens pass on the left. And this is on a staircase inside the subway and you can see them all over the subways instructing people, especially around the time of the joint uh, Korea-Japan World Cup in 2002, how to be cultured citizens, uh, how to be part of the first world, how to be part of the global north and all these kinds of problematic discourses that we might, you know, I might think are, are problematic and such. But so you find these interesting things that, uh, that strike you when you're a language learner and signs like this right here that I saw behind a shopping mall in the Dongdaemun area downtown Seoul as a non-Korean reader but at the time I thought well these really must say the same thing right until I looked up the words and asked my friends and found out that Namu means tree and root is an object marker and Sara means love and Hapsida is invoking us to do this to love the trees please <laughs> love the trees <laughs> Wow, <laughs> right? Wow, this is amazing. Why? You know, English and Korean are not exactly direct translations here, right? Although we might assume that when we don't read a language, when there are two languages together in a sign, often we assume they're saying the same thing. They're speaking with the same voice, but obviously not. Who is talking here? How many people are talking here? It's just a simple sign, but it's not. And that's why this is so interesting, and what's so interesting for me as a language research, as a language learner, and also as a researcher, going back home to Berkeley and now to New Haven, you know, seeing interactions, let's say, contestations, let's say, debate going on, actually even on the surface of the sign. And for every sign that looks like this, where there's graffiti or something else, there are so many other interactions that are never seen or never written down that we have with the language that's written and spoken around us. So I just wanted to start off with some questions, simple, based on these things that we've just seen. Who is talking to whom in the language that's all around us, and what exactly are they saying? Who has the right to write in public? Because it's not everybody. And where do they have that right? When and how do they have that right? Who is included and who is excluded from being represented in public spaces? How many languages are taught here at Columbia? How many can you see in the streets in New York? Where? What kind of things are they saying? What can be done about it? These are questions that I would start with here, I guess. So the outline and uh, is basically I want to give a brief introduction to linguistic landscape studies as a field, or as Steve said, a discourse. Uh, it has an identity uh, question as a new discipline in some ways. Uh, I'd like to just then think about what does this area of study, the written language in public space, uh, what kinds of standards or competencies can we as language educators think about with respect to this arena of language use? And what kinds of examples exist uh, already in teaching contexts? And I'm just going to give a few because there's many and there's so many that aren't called linguistic landscape that you're probably doing already. Um, and then discourse studies. Now if that isn't an all encapsulating circle, I'm not sure what it is. But um, it comes from a lot of places. and, and it, People who are doing linguistic landscape come from a lot of places and they have a lot of different purposes. So, why is it important? Well, hopefully you've got a little sense of that right now, especially as a language instructor, but one of the important things that Landry and Boris did when they, when they started in 97 was to say that linguistic landscape is not dependent uh, on a lot of other phenomena. It is not just reflecting realities that exist somewhere else, but in fact, linguistic landscape itself does things and it changes things. It changes society and relationships between people as we know them. 
They wrote, the presence or absence of rival languages in specific domains of the LL can come to symbolize the strength or weakness of competing ethnolinguistic groups in the intergroup setting. Exclusion of the in-group language from public science can convey a message to the effect that one's own language is not valued and has little status within society. If people don't see their language reflected outside, it has a tangible effect. That's their, their, their point. And the, vice, the flip side of that is true as well. So questions like in Canada, Quebec, and so on about the representation of French and English are one example of that. I'm going to skip this because we're spending uh, a lot of time here in the beginning. And I wanted to show you uh, a little bit about uh, a conference just to give you an idea of, in terms of the kind of scholarship that's going on right now in the linguistic landscape, what kind of things people are interested in, what they're talking about, uh, and then move into the pedagogical applications. So I was just uh, in South Africa two weeks ago, and they have a conference uh, in Cape Town, uh, and it was uh, put on by the University of Western Cape. There are about 75 people there from a lot of different countries, mostly European and African, but there were some from the US and South and Central America and other places as well. Um, and so like any good ling linguistic landscape where I took my camera out and started taking pictures during the conference, right? And, and, and it was great, so we just, <laughs> it looks kind of like this room. You know, a lot of people sitting, uh, sitting, and you know, listening, and you know, uh, let's see, I've got a text and all these other things going on at the same time, right? They're, they're all there, and the uh, uh, this is a waterfront, the uh, aquarium waterfront. It was right on the on the ocean, basically, um, and uh, it's a little dark to see here, um, but I'll just show you a few slides from some of the presentations that were going on there. Christopher Stroud and Zanny Bach are a couple of uh, folks at the University of Western Cape who talked about the representations of apartheid and discourses of young South Africans, went out and interviewed people to talk to them about their experiences of race in the places that they know and they inhabit. Apartheid ended in 1994, but 20 years later, young people who never lived uh, during apartheid are still talking about and living and experiencing these places that they moved between with respect to racial and social division. And they use terms that are reflected. Sometimes still you can find uh, uh, things, although almost all signs like this have been removed. They show this. This is a picture of their slide. Um, and they describe in their presentation how they say places have historical and personal meanings. They study issues of race, power, and representation through the linguistic landscape. And another presentation well, was by Tibros uh, Veldemeyer from, uh, from uh, Eritrea, who has been uh, doing research in Asmara and is interested in the balance of different languages. He's studying Arabic and uh, Amharic languages and looking at the signs to see how the different kinds of cultural uh, how the cultural uh, meeting between different groups in the city of Asmara is happening. So that's, he went in and actually interviewed a lot of the owners of these restaurants. And uh, Jackie Jiao is from City University of Hong Kong, and she did a very interesting study that has, I think, a lot of application to your language classrooms potentially. Um, in that she walked together with uh, with her research participant and asked them. What do you see around you? How do you? How does this strike you? What do you think about that sign there? And I'm not sure if you've ever done guided walking tours with any of your students, but it's a really interesting kind of uh, potential pair or group project. And this is the methodology that she used in her study: video walks with participants. Um, Guy Puzzi was another one who was looking at uh, place names and exploring the histories of place names. A very interesting topic. Um, and then there were also very interesting studies at a linguistic landscape conference, which people think is all about signs, talking about the body of the refugee. The body of the refugee who does not often have the right or the power to represent herself or himself in crystallized, uh, printed, fabricated, and produced signs and other things that mark the presence of, of this group of people. And yet, uh, the people, these people are very, very important. And so Galton is, is the specific area in South Africa that was focused on by Jadalan Donga, who from Northwest University, and just gave a very compelling and moving uh, presentation about the body as part of the landscape, and written with and written upon by language, but uh, not legibly in uh, the eyes of many people. And so that's an example. 
uh, and some my research projects. And I started in sort of around 2003 or 2004 when I started my PhD project <laughs> process. It took, yeah, about 10 years. <laughs> it took a while, right? And uh, I got right in with an ethnographic methodology course, a two semester sequence that allowed me to go into the area between Oakland and Berkeley in California, which is a highly diverse area. Uh, there are about 40 different languages that are spoken in Alameda County. Um, and it's an area where there was a big debate going on. Should we declare this as Koreatown? There were a lot of Korean businesses there. It is also a very heavily African-American community. It has, uh, there are uh, a large community of Arabic speakers there. There are a large uh, community of, of Ethiopian and Eritrean folks there too. And so the question of should this be declared by the city as Koreatown was really contentious at the time and it's still going on. And so representations of that kind of uh, debate often show pictures of signs and they made the US uh, mainstream sort of English language media made a lot of points about that talking about Korea and Oakland pointing to what happened to be Chinese language signs and not always only Korean signs and so there was a lot of misinformation and misrepresentation of people going on at the time. So I was interested in studying not what the signs look like from the outside, but what they look like from the inside. Mm -hmm. This is the view of a neon sign from a Kongtang Nengmyeon, a Kongtang, I don't know, Nengmyeon cold noodle soup uh, restaurant uh, inside Oakland, and um, talked to a lot of the shop owners and the folks who run these businesses to find out what kind of intentions they had and what kind of meanings that they were putting into the signs that were being read by a lot of the mainstream media as a claim to territory or something like that. Um, and that was a really problematic kind of reading that was being given to us. So I went and wanted to ask, well, how did you come up with these signs? How did you choose the words that go there? How did you choose to put Korean here and English here and not there? And these kinds of questions. And so I was asking, these kinds of questions I just summarized to you. Um, as I said, it was a couple semester sequence in an ethnography class and uh, in the School of Education. And what I found was that, well, in fact, you know, for instance, a lot of the owners of these shops who are being read and identified and even photographed by people as the sort of authors of these signs may have been moved into the shops long after they were created, they may have not uh, controlled or known about the signs themselves, and they didn't necessarily even pay attention to the signs very much. Some of them did, some of them didn't, but the media were looking at them and seeing them as, oh, you know, I'm saying that this is a Korean space. And so that was a really interesting finding, and that's in one of the, the things that Steve mentioned, the public publications. So this is sort of a, uh, the end of the, the summary sort of of what linguistic landscape is as a field, uh, it's been critiqued uh, a lot and some people take issue with the fact that, oh, you're just focused on language. These signs are so multi-dimensional and everything, they're not just linguistic. Um, and so uh, uh, Adam Dorsky and Kristen Thurlow are a couple of people who say, we're not going to call this linguistic landscape, we're going to call it semiotic landscape. And because we really want to focus on the fact that this is not just language, language is part of a multimodal whole. And as language teachers too, we can think about how to teach language connected to all of the different gestural and musical and sonic and imagistic and video kinds of meanings that language comes together with. Um, so this is what they said. Other people, of course, say the other word is a problem too. Who looks at landscapes? In what context do you look at landscape? What's your relationship like usually to a landscape? And uh, W.J.T. Mitchell at the University of Chicago has got a, a, an edited volume on the power of landscape and looks at the ways that images, landscapes in our mind and, uh, and in paintings and in other representations are constructions of power. And that even to call this linguistic landscape is very inappropriate in a sense because it suggests that the scholar or the viewer or the observer is surveying this territory and it stands in some kind of relationship of power and is not involved. And so that is a kind of a critique that's been going on a lot. Bernard Spolsky, who wrote one of the big studies to start off the field in, in the early 90s, you know, has been a long participant in this discussion and says, well, we need to figure this out. 
you know, how much is linguistic landscape? And people in Cape Town were wondering, can we talk about the body as linguistic landscape, or can't we just focus on science, on rectangular metal plates, <laughs> and just make it a little bit easier? But definition is a huge, a huge question. So in terms of language teaching, a stretch, and I think I like to take a stretch. And <laughs> I probably, yeah. Um, so we can think about lots of different ways in which now moving from this as an academic area into the to language teaching, what kinds of competencies uh, could be addressed? What kinds of purposes might this area of language use fill in our language classes? And if you're already using it, but I hope we can think together too about how, how many of these are, are addressed in your classes and what's missing from my presentation. Um, but we already talked a little bit about beginning literacy and vocabulary. There's certainly some theories that can go along with this. Um, some folks who write about linguistic landscape uh, in educational settings talk about sort of pragmatic and linguistic competences, uh, linguistic landscape as a source of direct and also implicit input uh, into the language learner's mind. Um, and it's also said that with the the fact that, the, that these signs are embedded in context, that connotation is something that you can really study very well with linguistic landscape. That's Dirk Boer and uh, uh, Senos uh, who, who uh, wrote that. And so I would suggest looking at that, um, that uh, chapter if you're interested in that idea. The idea of multimodality uh, has also already been uh, mentioned. Uh, the fact that, as, as Gunther Kress and uh, Perry Jewett would say, that different aspects of meaning are carried in different ways by each mode. Have you ever seen a green stop sign? It doesn't work. <laughs> it would be very, very cognitively dissonant to see a green stop sign and wonder, what do I do, right? So we read these things together. Uh, and New London Group has, has put out a very useful, uh, in 1996, it's running on 20 years, but still used quite a bit. Um, way of thinking about uh, not just the different kinds of design processes that literacy and language learners use in their everyday compositions of spoken and written text, but also the processes that we can use in thinking about new literacies that incorporate a very complex and a very social um, understanding of what literacy and language learning are. Um, Actful, of course, has uh, the five C's uh, is one of the kinds of benchmarks that a lot of us use in thinking about what our classes do and what kinds of competencies they address. And uh, it's interesting to go through there and think about it with respect to linguistic landscape as a site uh, and as a, an area of learning. But uh, especially I was thinking that connections, comparisons, and perhaps even the communities um, are very good places to think about you know, what kinds of activities we're doing outside of the classroom. Um, what kind, especially with respect to communities, what kind of involvement uh, is presupposed by the Actful and other organizations put out these, uh, these standards, I think. When I read communities, for instance, I thought, oh, this is interesting, the idea that students use the language within and beyond the school setting. There isn't anything in the Actful guidelines about any kind of reciprocity or relationship together with the community, which is another thing I think that would be interesting to think about, um, what kind of partnerships might be built through that. But, Anyway, this is a very interesting touch point. The Modern Language Association uh, Ad Hoc Committee on Foreign Languages from 2007 has a very, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with the document, but um, the idea of translingual transcultural competence has, I think, a lot of uh, relevance here. And Paginet uh, and colleagues uh, writing in Canada in linguistic landscape studies have uh, written about the, landscape, the linguistic landscape, that it signals what languages are prominent and valued in public and private spaces, and that as readers of signs, we see, we take in who's prominent uh, over another one. By seeing a sign with uh, Chinese and English, the Chinese above the English would mean that the Chinese perhaps is a dominant language. The flip side of that would be read differently if English were on top and those kinds of things. And MLA says that language learners should be led towards the ability to cultivate a heightened symbolic awareness that they should be able to, as they learn to use language, position each other with respect to the various kinds of identities and the various kinds of performances that tie into certain national histories or certain backgrounds and others. And this is something that uh, the linguistic landscape does every way. Do you have a New York signs uh, when you walk around the city and you're uh, 
you come into a new neighborhood, and it says, uh, welcome. Our neighborhood is a crime watch community. Suspicious activity will be reported to police immediately. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have this here? Or something else? We, have, we have forget about it. Welcome to Brooklyn. OK. <laughs> Those are all over, uh, over uh, Oakland and Berkeley, and it always made me wonder who I was when I was walking through a neighborhood. Welcome! And there's an iconic sort of big eye looking at you. <laughs> Our neighborhood is a crime watch community. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being positioned, perhaps, as a criminal. Signs that say man and woman, Yota and Namja, position us as male or female. Two choices and so on and so forth. There are signs that uh, direct people. We don't see signs that say, uh, like the sign that was uh, just showed you uh, uh, from South Africa, like the remnants from apartheid, but you don't have to look too far back in American history to see signs that classify people by race, classify people by all kinds of means. And we can see with respect to age, uh, the very young and the, and the elderly as well, that there are ways in which our language positions us. And this is the kind of competence, I think, we can find probably a, a way of talking about that from the ideas of the Modern Language Association, perhaps. Um, and sort of the last sort of, it's not really a competency, competency, but I would say potential of linguistic landscape too, is to think about how can we connect our language classes with other content areas on our campuses, other disciplines, other departments and programs on our campuses who are doing other things. People from linguistic landscape come from linguistics, geography, education, sociology, political science, environmental studies, semiotics, communication, architecture, uh, and so on. Right? I mean, and, and they come from a lot of places. And in fact, our interests are in those places too. And we all have intersecting, uh, uh, intersecting interests and potentially partnerships with colleagues on our campuses uh, that can expand our students' perspective about language study, perhaps. Alana Shahani. Uh, and Waxinger uh, talk about the ethnographic uh, methodology that's a potential of linguistic landscape study and which is also really relevant to the language classroom. So I want to give some examples of teaching and, uh, and this here uh, mention a few other people's work and then show you, I give you a handout, uh, an example of the class that I taught and then we'll, we'll move on to hear about some of the examples that are going on in Spanish uh, here at Columbia. Um, but uh, so Seir in, in uh, Oaxaca and uh, Luke Roland, who's working in Chiba, Japan, both have, they have different papers. Different. These are only examples that come from published linguistic landscape work. It's, there's so much going on out there. But it's, uh, I just wanted to show these examples that, that come from this body of literature. Um, they're both working in university EFL contexts. Um, and uh, they both uh, have their students who are in contexts in which there's a lot of English, the teachers felt. There's a lot of English around in public discourse, in public space, uh, in the city of Oaxaca and in Chiba and Japan. Um, but the students, they said, didn't seem to really be paying attention to all the English. And wow, why, why is that? Why did it become so natural to, to see English there and not other languages? Um, let's do a project where we get students thinking about why there are these languages in this everyday spaces, but not others. And so. They had students go out. Uh, they, first, they went out and they took a lot of pictures themselves as a teacher and they made a collection. But then they actually had their students, some of them used disposable cameras. That was a few years back. Students mostly probably can use uh, cell phones now or, or other uh, digital cameras. And go out and photograph instances of the target language or language they're learning in their everyday environments. And they gave them some specific directions in certain cases, only ones that are here or there or within this certain boundaries or in the, uh, during a certain event or something like that. Um, and then go and print, print out your pictures, bring them to class, discuss, and let's classify them. And they classify them in various ways, according to genre, according to location, according to purpose, according to the voices and the authors that they were reading from these. And they did activities like this in the classroom. Very interesting, very visual, very interactive with these artifacts, these printed pictures that came from the everyday uh, environments of the students. And so uh, even then, students had some questions about what to look for and how, so they gave some helping questions like this. Uh, what kind of sign are you seeing? Where is it located? Who made the sign? Who is the intended audience of the sign? Why do you think English is used on the sign and such? And uh, this might even be a good uh, a set of questions for Cityscape, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, anyhow, this was an interesting kind of uh, set of prompts that the, the teachers give the students when they go outside into public spaces. 
Pagine and colleagues, are, this is another study that came out in a linguistic landscape book, 2009, but they uh, were working in uh, Vancouver, I believe, and also in Montreal, and they, were, they paired some elementary school classes in these very diverse communities uh, together uh, in order to look at how languages were being used, not just written languages in the, the linguistic landscape, but spoken language and language in all aspects, but they wanted their students to be uh, paying attention to how language was being used around them. Um, and so they were going at this from a critical pedagogy uh, perspective, and they described that as literacy activities that encourage children, and they were, again, I think I mentioned elementary school children, but I think there's a lot of uh, activities here, uh, ideas here that are very useful at the university level too, put into uh, a different framework perhaps. But um, really wanting the, the children to start to wonder and to look at their environment and start to think about, again, why certain things get represented and certain things don't. Why certain things look a certain way and other things look that way. Why we use this word to describe this thing and we don't use that word? Those kinds of questions. Um, and so they took, again, yes, uh, children outside to analyze the prominence and the value of languages in, in public and private spaces. So these are, is this all visible from the back? I think this is my slides, my smallest print. Good, Bill? Yep. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so these are the kinds of things that they did. And I'll give these slides to you as well. If, if you find them interesting or useful, uh, you're very welcome to have them. Um, so they had, uh, before they brought their, uh, their, their children outside, they actually sat down in the classroom and they had uh, them do some kind of, by memory, descriptions and narrations of the places that were familiar to them, places that they traveled. Um, and they, uh, they did that not just with themselves as an audience writing for their, themselves, but they were describing these as part of an exchange with the students who were located across Canada, across on the other side of the country, where the surroundings look very different. And so this is a sort of a telecollaborative uh, arrangement. They also did, uh, in addition to verbal descriptions, they had students draw and maybe make maps and drawings of familiar places uh, to them. And so, uh, and they, were, they had the teachers who were asking the students, now, please write down or indicate somehow which languages do you hear in these everyday places of your everyday experience? What languages do you see or do you think you see? And then after that, let's go there and check. Let's go there and see if there's anything that, that looks different or uh, the same as what you thought. And so they went walking and they had students with notepads and then they would write down notes or they would draw pictures as they went outside uh, on these field trips. and. They uh, asked them to pay attention to not only what they saw and where it was, this geographical uh, fixed sort of a perspective, but also the kinds of sociological uh, inferences that they were making. Why do you think this is here? Who, what does it look like this is? Or where does it look like it came from? And what do you guess? Um, and they had a, a way of drawing that with using a coordinate system. And so they had students using uh, cameras and doing photography, documenting linguistic diversity, mapping activities, again, and, and bringing it back to the classroom, uh, discussing and doing writing activities. And that kind of so I won't spend much time here on this. I'll just show you these three very briefly. But uh, if you're interested in going to linguistic landscape literature, there's a big, big, uh, big bibliography that I'll share with you. And even when the writing is not about teaching per se. Some of the methodologies that are being used and the concepts they're using are really applicable, I think, to teaching situations as well. So there's this walking tour study that was done by Rebecca Todd Garvin, for instance, and Del Heim's speaking mnemonic has students analyzing this, or, or think, he was thinking about this course in terms of Del Heim's uh, speaking you know, setting who's the participating in the discourse, what are the goals of the discourse, what act sequences are being played out here. And this can be done with respect to, of course, spoken language, but also written language in place. And so that was a, uh, that's a suggestion that I have, is that we, as educators, pay attention to this literature for that purpose, too. Um, here's a couple of things that I've done in the classroom. The first one I have a few pictures of, the second one's on the end up. Um, in 2005, I had a project with the Language Center at Berkeley to make a telecollaborative uh, pro uh, project, which is an online discussion forum which had images uh, which were connected to a map. It was right after Google released its API, so we could actually put the images onto maps and things, and have students uh, in two different places. Uh, let's see, let's, let's 
not right here, uh, at UC Berkeley, uh, students who were in the first and second year studying Korean, uh, and they were paired up online with students who are in Korea at Suwon University who were studying English, looking at pictures of each other's everyday landscape, okay. and then having a discussion about that. So these are some of the goals there. Um, to show you a few pictures of what it looked like. You can see it's sort of like a, uh, a form that you might be familiar with, and something might look kind of familiar when you see this one. <laughs> oh yeah, this was a picture from that form as well, and we had our students, not just me and, and a few other people who are academically interested in it, but uh, language students uh, in Korea and in the US talking about this picture and trying to figure out what's going on here. I don't think they reached a conclusion, but there were a lot of interesting discussions. And this one as well was talked about in the context of a, tele, of a tele collaboration. We had an interview there with the owner of the restaurant. The students could read the words of the owner uh, and interact with those words as well. And we tried to get more student in, uh, participation and interaction. Uh, we had uh, you know, students taking pictures and sending them to us. It wasn't easy to upload them, but it made this so much more fun. The last bathroom picture animated by the student bent over so uncomfortably in showing us and students you know, celebrating reaching the top of the mountain and these things that made, you know, made a, a school website so much more interesting. Um, the second one is uh, just very briefly the handout uh, that you have right there and you might have had a chance to look over it. Um, but last year in 2011, so several years later, uh, this is a very different kind of class. Uh, but this class was in the East Asian Languages and Cultures Department at UC Berkeley uh, that I got approval to teach for a couple semesters. It was a freshman-sophomore seminar, two units, which is a small class, meeting only once a week for two hours. It was not a language class, but it was more sociolinguistics and applied language studies, a kind of a class. And the idea was to introduce the students to this potential uh, to open their eyes uh, and to the linguistic diversity around them and to start asking critical questions as well as being introduced to little bits of beginning literacy in Japanese, Korean, and Chinese. And you can see in the little box on the bottom right there, it says each week's three, uh, each three week cycle structure that we actually uh, introduced a new topic uh, every three weeks, uh, new questions that the students would be focusing on. Um, and we tried to put in a little bit of uh, methodology that the linguistic landscape uh, scholars were using to sample uh, the languages and collect languages in public space. But we also had visits from faculty. Uh, we had lecturers come in from Korean, Japanese, and Chinese and teach the students how to write a few characters. And that was really neat for them too, to get their curiosity going about the languages that they see around them. And so you can see more about it uh, there. There's some more information on the back, uh, some sample questions that I developed, uh, and I'd love to have your feedback on those. Um, for a project where we did a field trip to a Japan town in San Francisco, about a half hour away by train. Um, and we had a website up uh, here. It's, you have the address right there in the box in the front part of the handout. It's still there if you'd like to go check it out and see and, think, and give me some advice. You know what, this would have gone a lot better if you'd done it like this or <laughs> any kind of helpful resources that we could share. I'd love to know because uh, I'm hoping that you know, there will be chances to do things like this in the future again, too. So uh, and maybe together with you in collaboration, I, I would hope that would be, that would be really neat. Um, one of our projects as well was to have students write blogs, and they wrote blog responses every week and, and uh, wrote back to each other about those. So we had students writing about their experiences, not just reading. We, we did readings, and we also had students putting pictures of the things that they were seeing and interpreting them with respect to the readings that we were doing in the class. So here's a student writing about those. These are all also linked to the, to the website. You can read them if you're interested after the, the presentation, um, and so on and so forth. And the last project of the class was a, an article that uh, we wrote together uh, that was published in a local newspaper, online newspaper called Berkeleyside. Um, and uh, the students basically gave me uh, sections of text from their blogs and talked about it in, in a class, and then we put this article together and published it. So it's there on Berkeley side if you're interested, um, but it got some comments from the, the public and the community as well, and so that was one way for students to connect their classroom experience with the outside community. Um, okay, so we're just finishing up right here, and uh, I'm sorry that I've gone a little longer than, than was planned. But, um, 
Linguistic Landscape Workshop, I think I want to mention an extended invitation to you on behalf of other people who are putting it together, but that the, this workshop that was in Cape Town, South Africa, where people talk about the research they're doing, said we really are interested in pedagogical applications. And so, you know, who better experts at that than us? And so, uh, this is happening next year at Berkeley, uh, those dates, May 7th to 9th, uh, 2015. So if you're at all interested, uh, please talk to me about it and we can get more information. There's a great bibliography uh, of, of readings if, if your curiosity is piqued about literature here. Uh, uh, Rob Troyer at Western Oregon University has put this together and the link is going to be available on the website that I'll that I give to you later. Sorry about the visibility here. Um, this is a site that's up for sharing articles and uh, it's joinable by anybody, but uh, basically this is for resources, learning resources or news articles or any other kinds of things that might be interesting to, uh, to collect together. There's also a collection of photos that is open to anybody to contribute on Flickr, and it's, uh, I think the initiative here is going to be the, the Cityscape project, but this is something as, as well that would be interesting to look at. People out there in the world contributing their photos of the linguistic landscape. Um, so the things that I'm thinking about as I turn this uh, over to our <laughs> colleagues in Spanish here is you know, potential of maybe making networks together uh, by, for instance, uh, aggregating the images that we take that we use in our classes from different languages uh, that we teach and looking at uh, having students in one language maybe compare images from other languages and, and using those in their classrooms for instance um, putting lesson plans together so that you know we can share ideas about what uh, we have for teaching uh, perhaps doing field trips or projects across languages that's you know it's a definite possibility in a city which is as rich as ours we might need students from other language classes to help us read things sometimes. Um, Cross-disciplinary partnerships, I mentioned a little bit before, with other departments and programs. Some of the kinds of things I'm thinking, I know that there's going to be some, there are mural, murals being painted and drawn, and, and that's something that maybe language students could get involved in as well. Um, working with people and partner students in city and regional planning and stuff, people working on language policy to actually change the way that things are labeled. Uh, on menus or on, on signs or on Google Maps or on Yelp or on all kinds of places. Um, working uh, support services with immigrant and refugee support uh, and other kinds of areas uh, of community-based learning are some of my ideas and thank you for listening so long and attentively and that's all I have. Thank you very much. Come down